All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome. And uh, thank you for connecting to this um, Thursday mentoring hour. So, okay, can hear now. Um, Thursday mentoring hour. We just have an open time for question, answers, discussion, um, sharing, so that we could um, learn from each other and learn through the times of discussion and interaction that we have. Thank you so much for connecting. So we're going to pray, then we're going to get into our uh, time of discussion um, and interaction. Um, let's see, who would like to lead today? Roshan or Paul? Um, one of you, or would either of you like to? Yeah, I'll do it, Pastor. Okay, Roshan, you can do it. Pastor. Okay. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, Pastor Roshan will be our host today. He will uh, coordinate all the questions and discussions. And of course, everybody is uh, welcome to participate and contribute towards the discussions. Uh, let's pray and we will get uh, started. All right. Maybe uh, Prabhakar, could you please lead us in prayer and then Pastor Roshan will take up from there. Sure, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, praise Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Our dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We acknowledge your holy name. We exalt you, Father. Uh, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity at this moment. Mm. We are team gathered, Father, for the supernatural hour, discussions and interactions, Father. Please lead this hour into a beautiful journey, Father, so that we can interact and learn from each other, Father. Uh, holy Spirit, we welcome you to guide us throughout the way, Father. Uh, from the beginning to the end, each moment shall be enriching and blessed in Holy Spirit experience. Bless each and every member of our team, Father. And those who are coming, let them end, Father, in time so that we can have a wonderful session. I dedicate uh, this time and all glory and thanksgiving to your holy name. And I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Father. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, so today Pastor Roshan is going to be our host and uh, we will all participate in our in the discussions. Uh, Roshan, over to you. Okay, thank you, Pastor Ashish. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to a uh, weekly mentoring hour. Uh, right, uh, so we'll uh, take time to answer any questions, uh, even share. On any of the topics of uh, of leadership, um, discipleship, uh, growing, growing spiritually, some of the spiritual um, disciplines, habits, uh, any any questions that you might have, uh, please shoot. As you all know, we have the most wonderful panel of of teachers, uh, and so yeah, just uh, go for it. And uh, yes, okay. Shani, yes, uh, I see you've raised your hand. Go ahead, please. Yes, so I'm asking this question because um, some of my family asked me this question. I couldn't answer it. So um, I was asked who created God. Okay. And I don't know the answer to that. All right. Okay, Shani, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, so the question is who created God? Um, all right, who would like to go for that? Yeah, so, yeah, Shani, um, nobody, you know, so God is self-existent. That means uh, he never had a beginning. As the Bible tells us, uh, from everlasting to everlasting. I think there's Psalm 90 and verse 2. It says, uh, from everlasting, uh, yeah, Psalm 90, verse 2. Uh, of course, there are many scriptures on this, but... Uh, Psalm 90 verse 2 says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So the God of the Bible is an eternal, self-existent being. So he doesn't depend on anybody else uh, for his existence. Because if anybody created God, then 
that being would be God, you know. So um, the answer is straightforward. The Bible is telling us that God is the eternal self-existent God who never had a beginning. You know, it's from it, eternity to eternity, right? Now, we uh, people think in, in terms of time. So we have a beginning, we have an ending. And so uh, a lot of our thinking is with respect to time. And um, a lot of what we do is res with respect to time. But we have to stretch our mind to think of God, of the being God, who doesn't have time. He always is. Right? So the answer is nobody created God. He's an eternal, self-existent being who doesn't depend on anybody else. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Thank you, Shani, for the question. Uh, all right, so we go to the next question that's uh, from John Paul. Uh, the question is from Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 7. Okay, uh, the first question is the apostasy mentioned here. All right, actually, let's just uh, read the scriptures. Second Thessalonians 3, uh, chapter 2, verse 3 to 7. Uh, okay, so it says, I'm reading from the NLT version. Don't be fooled by what they say. Uh, hey, John, should I read from the NLT or would you, is there a specific version? Um, either is fine. I was using NASB, but I think either is fine. Okay, let me also get NASB then. I'll be on the same page. Okay, just one second. All right. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, from 3 to 7 from the NASB version. Uh, it says, no one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Verse 5, you do not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. Verse 6, and you know what restrains him now, so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is removed. So let me read that verse 3 again. No one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless apostasy comes first. And the, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object. Okay, so the first question there uh, is, the apostasy mentioned here is to occur before the rapture or after seven-year tribulation? Uh, can we uh, address that first question, uh, please? Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so John, um, so Paul is uh, writing to us here about... Um, the coming of uh, this man of perdition, or we know him as the Antichrist, and uh, you know when he will come, and so on, right? And uh, he says this man will come. Uh, he's going to exalt himself uh, above all that's God. He's going to be in the temple of God, and so on. And then he, a uh, verse seven, he says this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, uh, of course, Paul is writing, and with with you know he's writing here, and with him is the uh, the the prophecies of the Old Testament. So, uh, the reference here, of course, is Daniel chapter nine and verse twenty seven, where he talks about uh, that Daniel has spoken about the man of sin, perdition, uh, and so on. So the sequence of so let me answer verse seven. I'll answer the second question first, which is. Um, the verse seven, you know, what what is he referring to? He who restrains. Now, many people say, you know, say he is about the Holy Spirit, but actually, if you look at it, he has to be the church, not the Holy Spirit. Reason being, throughout the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit is still on earth, working on earth. So the Holy Spirit is not taken out of the earth. The Spirit of God is working throughout um, the tribulation here on earth. So many reasons. Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 7 talks about the 144,000 Jews who are sealed by the Holy Spirit. 
uh, throughout the book of Revelation, we have people uh, who have testimony to the to Jesus Christ. Uh, who have, uh, and uh, Revelation 19, 11 talks about that the testimony is the spirit of prophecy, so the Holy Spirit. Uh, also, Zechariah chapter 12 talks about the last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which affects the entire nation of Israel. Uh, so there will be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit taking place during the tribulation. So the only option we have for verse 2 of, uh, of 7, the he who restrains is uh, the church. The church will be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit is going to continue working during the tribulation period here on earth. Like I mentioned, there are many references to the work of the Holy Spirit. People are going to be saved during uh, the time of the tribulation, and you cannot be saved apart from the Holy Spirit. Uh, people are going to be proclaiming the gospel, and you cannot proclaim the gospel apart from the Holy Spirit. So all these reasons indicate that the Holy Spirit is going to be very much here on the earth, uh, working through the people during the tribulation. Now, a problem that many people have with verse 7 is uh, it's using the masculine pronoun he but remember the church is not only called the bride of christ but also the body of christ which is masculine so it's perfectly fine to refer use the masculine pronoun he to refer to the church in as much as the feminine pronoun bride is used to refer to the church so this, that's, there's no contradiction there there's not a problem there so to answer your question verse seven uh, it is um the the church and then there are many other reasons why uh, we can you know substantiate the statement that the church is taken out of the way before or at the before the beginning of the seven year tribulation so that then helps us understand the preceding verses so what exactly is going to happen uh, the church will be taken out of the way then the man of sin will be revealed right uh, lawlessness is already at work uh, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work, but once verse 7 happens, the church is taken out of the way, then the man of perdition comes. And then if you study, the, you know, and of course we will have this course in your second year on the end times, and also in the third year you'll, you'll study Revelation, Daniel in detail. Uh, but the sequence of events is, you know, the Antichrist appears um, as a man of peace. So Revelation chapter 6 verse 1, he comes riding on a white horse. That means he comes as a man of peace. Uh, Daniel 9.27, he confirms a covenant of peace. So he comes as a man of peace with a solution for the Middle East. But in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, again, Daniel 9.27 talks about it. Uh, Revelation 11.1 1 talks about it. That at the middle of the tribulation, which is at the end of the first three and a half years, he breaks his covenant. He sets, sets himself up in the temple of God and he desecrates the temple. So that is what is being spoken of in the preceding verses here. Is that okay? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Uh, thanks, John, for that question. Uh, as Pastor was saying, more on that in the second year eschatology course and uh, Revelation and Daniels in the final year. Uh, okay. Um, let's, let's move on to the next question we have is from Kiran. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. Can we explain? Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 for context. Okay. Uh, the heading of this chapter says, A warning against dr drifting away. So here we go. It says, So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard. And so we may drift away, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. Uh, okay. Uh, Kiran, also, is there anything in specific that you're looking for from this verse? Okay. All right. Uh, Right. Uh, can uh, someone respond uh, to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2, please? Anybody? Right. Pastor Nancy, would you like to have a go at it? Uh, yes, thank you, Pastor Roshan. Uh, so uh, here uh, in this verse, <coughs> we, we are told that uh, we must give, give heed to... Um, what has been 
what has been revealed to us, what has been given to us uh, much more. And then if you look at the context, like Hebrews chapter one, uh, basically it talks about the Lord Jesus and how he is the exact representation of the father and, you know, um, all that he, he brings and his deity. Um, so, uh, what what the writer of the Hebrews is saying is that if when uh, people gave so much of importance to the law of Moses, which was considered you know to to be handed by angels, uh, uh, he is just bringing our attention and our focus to what the Lord Jesus brings and you know the new covenant that that uh, um, he is the author of and that we must give more attention to that. So uh, yeah, that that's what I would like to share, and yeah. Anyone else? I hope I'm uh, correct and I'm answering Kiran's question. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah, you just Pastor. just one one thought here. I think yes, Kiran, um, maybe what's confusing is the word angels, right? For if the word spoken through angels, you know, so it's like, hey, did angels give us the word of God? That's not true. Uh, you just have to look up the Greek. The Greek word, the angels, is angelos, which simply means messengers. Okay, It's a generic word that's used both for human messengers as well as for angels. It just happened to be translated here in the King James as, as um, King James and New King James as angels. But really, what he's referring to is the word spoken through messengers, meaning God's messengers, not angelic beings, but God's messengers. So, um, the, uh, like Nancy said, uh, he's referring to the entire Old Testament, the, the uh, Old Testament scriptures, but it's given to us through messengers of God, right? Not angels, but basically saying, look, this word given to us, like the rest of the explanation is exactly what uh, Pastor Nancy said. I just wanted to clarify that word, angels. Is that okay? Thank you, Pastor Ashish, for adding. Uh, Kiran, any follow-up question? Uh, clear. Okay, I believe it's clear because uh, there is also so another I, question from I Kiran. Think. From sorry, Kiran, I missed that. Hello, Kiran. Sorry, I missed what you said. Yeah. Yeah. So well, first, okay. gentlemen, five. Chapter 5 and verse 8. Right, right. Okay. Okay, sure. First John chapter 5, verse 8. Okay. Uh, let me read uh, from uh, verse 5 from First John chapter 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Verse 7, for there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Okay. Okay. Uh, Pastor Jay, Jay Kumar, uh, would you like to re respond to that? Yeah, Roshan, hi. Um, <clears throat> Um, the spirit, water, and the blood. So it's talking about um, uh, verse seven. Of course, uh, it's very clear: the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, um, and these three witnessing, and three are one. Um, verse eight: um, on the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Um, but I, I'm not very clear, Russian. Um, uh, because in verse um, 6, it's talking about the physical birth of the Lord Jesus. Um, probably Pastor can clarify. I think we'll... Pastor Ashish, can I just defer the question to you, Pastor? Sure. sure. Yeah. So, the, um, so verse uh, 6, 7, and 8, right? So, uh, he's, he, so, basically, in John's episode, yeah, uh, he's talking about... The definitiveness of their experience with Jesus, right? So when he begins John, first John chapter one, he says, "The one whom we have seen and heard, whom we have handled, 
we're talking about that person. So John is telling us, look, uh, I'm not writing to you about, you know, some spiritual fiction, you know, it's not uh, fiction. The one whom are, we have seen, whom we have handled, whom, you know, we have encountered personally, we're writing about him, okay? So he's, that's how he starts off his episode, First John chapter one, the first few verses. So now we're coming down to, he's, he's getting ready to conclude. So once again, he's coming back to the same thing saying, look, this son of God that we spoke of, that, you know, verse five, you know, uh, Jesus is the son of God, right? This is the one whom we're talking about. And, uh, and, and, and now he's reiterating how, how we have witness that he is the son of God. So that's, that's why verse you know, six, seven, eight come in. So he says, verse six, you know, he came by water and blood, right? So water and blood would be, again, uh, we, we interpret it in, in the context of him being attested to. So water, that is the water of baptism, right? So when Jesus was baptized, there was a clear attestation from heaven, right? And John, not Saint, not John, the writer of the gospel, but John the Baptist bore testimony. And John was uh, one of those early disciples of Jesus. He probably was a disciple, let me just, uh, uh, validate this. I think he was a disciple of John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God, follow him. Then the disciples, his disciples, going looking at John chapter 1, they left John and they followed Jesus. Right? So um, they um, so they had uh, uh, yeah, so this is John one thirty seven. Okay, so um, they had testimony of Jesus being the Son of God through the water, the waters of baptism. Heavens were opened, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And, um, and, and that is also in verse 6, the Spirit bore witness. Right? So water is the water of baptism. At the water of baptism, the Holy Spirit bore witness to who Jesus Christ is. John, 1 John 5 verse 6 is a Spirit who bears witness and the Spirit is truth. Right, and then blood is of course the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Okay, so then verse seven. So that's the earthly side of the witness: water, the waters of baptism, where the Holy Spirit bore witness; the blood, the cross of Christ. Verse seven is witness in heaven: Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. They are in agreement. Then eight, the with three witness on the the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the water. That is water of baptism the blood that is the cross. All of these are attesting to one thing. Jesus is the son of God. So to answer your question, water is talking about the water of baptism, where the Holy Spirit bore witness to Jesus. Is that okay, Karen? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Kieran, for that, uh, yeah, for that question. All right, awesome. Okay, so, uh, please feel free to uh, share questions in the chat section. Uh, okay, so we have a question here from Christopher. It says, please explain why there are some radical differences in the genealogy that is accounted by Matthew and Luke in the New Testament number of generations genealogy through Joseph versus genealogy through Mary, which is the preferred account. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's an interesting question. Okay. Uh, right, who would like to take that one? The question on genealogy of Jesus. Uh, maybe uh, we should defer the answer to next week. We'll do a little study and come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Even I can't. I mean, I'm just trying to think of it, Christopher. You know, uh, uh, Matthew was addressing uh, 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 generally what is stated is uh, Matthew is addressing uh, a, a Jewish audience. Luke is addressing uh, uh, the Roman audience. 
Uh, and so we need to look at it from that perspective. But uh, I think uh, if, you know, we would come back with an answer on this next Thursday, uh, we'll do a little bit of study and we, we, I'm sure we'll have an answer, but we'll have to look at it from these two perspectives, who, you know, the audience that was being addressed. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Christopher, so yeah, we'll uh, respond to your question in the following week. Uh, is that okay? Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, so until we get uh, another question in the chat section, uh, so one of the questions uh, you know that I often get from young people, Abraham, I saw you raised your hand. We'll get to that if that's okay. Just a, um, minute. So one of the questions that I get a lot uh, from young people is uh, from, uh, you know, when uh, what in our context, when God asks us to uh, forsake, uh, you know, everything and completely surrender and follow him, uh, what does that really mean, uh, you know, in, in the context of, uh, of our lives today? Um, and uh, so I think, uh, like, on, on multiple times, uh, they were referring to uh, the disciples uh, as in, okay, they forsook everything, what they were doing, and they followed him. Um, and so I did not really have a definitive, a very clear answer. Uh, but, uh, can, uh, can someone just uh, shed light on, on that, please? Anybody? Pastor Paul, Pastor Nancy, Jean, Pastor Ashish, Pastor Jakes. Uh, okay, Pastor Roshan. Yeah, I'll just share uh, some thoughts that I have. Uh, sure. um, yeah, so I'm thinking like uh, when uh, disciples followed Jesus, many of them left everything, you know, uh, it, like we see them leaving behind their profession and just going, staying with Jesus and learning from him. And uh, that's what each one of us wants to do, right? Like when, when you're, uh, when God is inviting us. Uh, we we just want to follow Him and and do nothing else. Um, but does that mean that we leave behind uh, the the life we have? You know, the career we have, the family we have, the the goals we have, the skills we have. Um, so I'm thinking like uh, maybe that's not what it means. Yes, God is calling us to a place of surrender. But at the same time, uh, also looking at the life of Jesus, we know that the most important thing that Jesus wanted to do was the will of the Father. So I think the emphasis is there. Uh, if we can uh, if we can hear from God and if we can understand what it is that the Father wants us to do, and if that involves you know, me leaving my career and um, getting into you know, full-time ministry or something like that, if it's the Father's will for my life, then yes, you know, yes, forsake other things and, and move in that direction. But if it's not, then just go by what the Father's will is. So um, uh, those are my thoughts. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Okay, uh, would anybody like to add to that? Uh, yeah. I, I just... Uh... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um... Actually, um, in Luke chapter 14, right, uh, that's, uh, that's again uh, where he says, uh, you know, if anyone, uh, 14 and verse 25 to 33, uh, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yeah, he has his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And then, uh, you know, he says uh, one more thing, like uh, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then 28 onwards, he talks about counting the cost, like you, you know, someone who builds a tower, you know, you sit down, you count the cost and then you, and then you do it. Um, and then towards, uh, I think in verse 33 is where he says, uh, likewise, um, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has um, cannot be my disciple. So, um, you know, when we look at um, the context in which he says that forsaking all, um, 
of course he's talking about human relationship and then the fact that his our relationship with the lord has to take precedence overall in the sense uh, like i heard someone say you know that relationship in the context of that relationship every other relationship looks like you know as if you hate <laughs> you know okay. it, it fades into um, kind of uh, oblivion um, uh, and also counting the cost you count the cost and say you know there is a, a cost to uh, uh, to follow the Lord, um, and you know, whoever wants to live um, a godly life will suffer persecution. Uh, Paul writes, and therefore, um, yeah, it is about uh, this forsaking all is about, uh, of course, forsaking our selfish interests and uh, selfish ambitions, but also uh, from a place of uh, counting the cost and willing to uh, bear that cost. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, Wonderful, um, Pastor. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, Jean, uh, would you like to? Yeah, I, I think it's very similar to what uh, Pastor Jay Kumar had said. It's, uh, uh, I think my references are from Philippians 3, 7 and 8. I'll just read that out. Uh, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. But indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So, um, yeah, in, in addition to the cost, it is to count everything superior, supreme, uh, above all, um, beyond uh, anything else that may take on um, our passion or our interest. So, uh, so pursuing Christ, pursuing um, Him and walking in fellowship with Him, surpasses everything else uh, in whatever it may be it may be uh, work it may be relationships it may be self-interest um all of that so that's just another aspect of forsaking all things for christ awesome thank you Pastor. thank you jane thank you yes <laughs> thank you for helping me out <laughs> uh okay uh, let's move on uh, abraham uh yeah, if you don't mind could you uh share your question please and then we'll get to and then uh, we'll get Sikhidna. to uh, Sikhidna. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning, pastors. Good morning, I, Abraham. Good morning, I, Abraham. Personal challenge that I want to seek some advice. I was trying to help a friend. I mean, I met him at church, I think some time ago, and he just called me that he's looking for a place to stay. So I just decided to give him um, one of my rooms because I live in a two-bedroom. So I decided to give him the other one. But when he came, he came, I think, in uh, May. There was a lockdown. So since May, he has been staying with me. But the challenges that he's bringing is too much. Sometimes he would just go out and go and drink alcohol and then lie outside. Then the apartment will call me. I have to go and take him outside and bring him in. Sometimes he will even go and drink and then probably he will sleep outside till the next day. So... He has done this for a very long time, and finally, he he got a COVID. Even though we are in the same apartment, he got a COVID. I didn't get a COVID. He went to the quarantine site for almost about 14 days. He came back, I think, last week. This, I mean, yesterday, he just took my motorbike. He went, and he has not returned. So do I drive this guy out of my house, or what do I do? Knowing that we are Christians and we have to help each other, we have prayed for him severally, but... It looks as if he's not willing to change, and I don't know what to do. So I just want advice on how to handle this guy, whether to drive him out or to still continue to pray for him. Because the disgrace, I just received a message from the apartment that if he does not stay home, then they themselves will come and drive him out. So I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Please help me. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Abraham. Uh, th thank you for expressing uh, your concern. Uh, Pastor Ashish, would you uh, like to just respond to Abraham, please? Yeah, Abraham, I can I can tell you what I would do. This is not Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we all know what you would do. <laughs> uh, this is not chapter and verse. It's just what I would do. I would uh, I would tell him to leave, and. Uh, you know, because he's being a problem. He's not. Uh, he, he's not willing to respect you, or uh, respect the uh, the whole 
the apartment people, whatever. So yeah, it just uh, there's nothing wrong in you uh, uh, being firm and saying, please find a place somewhere else. I mean, I'm sure there'll be plenty of other places where he can go and stay. So uh, you could, uh, and that's what I would do, right? Uh, because you have been very patient with him and, and this is like pushing it too far. He should not abuse your kindness. So we are called to be kind. We are called to be loving, but we, 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 we can't let people abuse our kindness or abuse our goodness towards them. So don't feel, don't feel guilty that, you know, you're, you are taking this kind of a stand. It's perfectly fine. That's my, uh, response back to you Rosh. back to you Rosh. yeah okay thank you pastor thank you pastor thank you pastor thank, thank you abraham um for that honest question uh okay uh so we have a question from sigidna robert here and uh just he says pastor i just wanted to know that according to genesis god created the heavens and the earth and the spirit of god was roaming around the face of the earth and we also know that god was present before the creation then why the world says that Lord Shiva is the creator of the world? Why Hinduism is considered as the first form of religion of the of the world? Why Shiva is called Yaksha Swarupa, which has a meaning, uh, which means a person who existed before the existence of the universe, same like the God in uh, as Genesis. So, uh, yes. How okay. Um yeah, so um, Sidkino, I think there are many questions in this in this paragraph that you've written. Um, so just we'll quickly address them. So uh, why is uh, Hinduism considered the oldest religion? Well, if you even though you know the Book of Genesis is starting from the creation now, so basically. Uh, okay, so Christianity is not because Christianity basically started in AD 30 formally. Christianity started then. Uh, but then what do we have? We have Judaism and we have Hinduism. Now, Judaism, the formal formal beginning is with Abraham. He's the patriarch, which is 2000 years after creation, right? So that's when Judaism has its beginning. But uh, with the patriarch Abraham and God called Abraham, but uh, God revealed to Moses, uh, you know, the first five books, uh, which starts off with the creation of the earth uh, and creation of everything. So although the formal beginning of Judaism is with the patriarch Abraham, the scriptures, the uh, Old Testament scriptures, or, or, or let's say before the what we call as Old Testament, which was the Hebrew scriptures. The Hebrew scriptures go back all the way to the very beginning, that is Genesis chapter one. Okay, so that's the only difference. So um, the formal beginning of Judaism is with Abraham, but the scriptures go back, the revelation given to Moses, go back all the way to Genesis chapter one. So that is why Hinduism is considered as the oldest religion, although the beginnings of, uh, you, know, if, you know, Adam was the first person created and everybody tra heart traces back, uh, human life traces back to Adam. Okay, so it, in, in the formal beginnings, uh, of course, uh, Judaism comes 2000 years after Genesis chapter one, but the scriptures go back all the way. Now, uh, the God of the Bible, uh, there was a question we answered at the very beginning. Uh, the God of the Bible is eternal self-existent, right? So uh, the, the God, God, God of the Bible doesn't begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. He's, he's before that. He always existed. And, uh, and then Genesis 1 only gives us the beginning of creation. But the God of the Bible is eternal, self-existent. Now, because just because there are, uh, let's say, uh, and this shouldn't matter that you know, uh, let's say in the Hindu scriptures, you have uh, references to one of the gods uh, as uh, a, a person who existed before cre the creation. It doesn't matter. Uh, the God of the Bible is an eternal, self-existent God who always was before the beginning of creation. Is that okay, Sitkinu? Uh, do you have a follow-up question? No, 
Okay. Uh, is this no follow up question? Thank you, Pastor. Uh, thank you for responding to that question once again. Okay. Uh, just to move on, uh, we have another question from Christopher. Uh, he says, The soul consists of the mind, emotions, and will. Some of these can be used uh, by the evil one. Example, anger can lead to rage. So we need to seek the blessings of the Holy Spirit to keep these type of emotion within control. Uh, as per the Bible, uh, are, there, is, uh, are there a list of inherent emotions that are part of the soul? Example, joy, anger. As part of the Bible, is there a list of inherent emotions that are part of the soul? Uh, uh, Pastor Paul, would you like to respond to that, please? Yes, thank you, Roshan. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for that question. Um, right. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I don't really know. I'm not really sure of uh, the verse, uh, the chapter and verse. Uh, uh, maybe if somebody knows that, can go ahead and share it. Uh, but yes, uh, the soul uh, consists of the mind will and emotions. And, um, uh, and so the Bible teaches us that we are to you know the 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 Holy Spirit uh, inside us. We are to, you know, be able to control uh, our mind, our will, our emotions. And and there are verses like, for example, uh, you know, uh, Paul writes to the Romans in Romans twelve two. He says, "Be not uh, be conformed to this world, but be uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind." And so it is a responsibility uh, of us like we have that responsibility of renewing our mind so uh, salvation happens at that one instant but but the process of uh, renewing our mind uh, is, is something that we have to uh, do and 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 so uh, uh, as I said uh, Christopher I, I'm not really sure of the worst but uh, but practically uh, you know uh, emotions is part of everyone right we all you know, uh, go through happiness or oh, there's sadness, there's anger. Oh, it's part of everyone. And so uh, we as believers, with the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, can, you know, take control of, uh, you know, our mind, will, and emotions uh, within us uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. So uh, I, I leave it there. Maybe somebody else can add to that. Uh, anyone else can. Add. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor yeah. Paul. Yes, Pastor uh, Roshan, I'd, I'd just like to add. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so uh, I think some, a few references and, and a few thoughts. So the first thing that we do see is, um, you know, man was made in God's image. And God uh, is a relational God. Uh, you know, we see that in the Trinity. It says, let us make man in his own, uh, in, in our image. So he is a relational God. And in a relationship, there is an expression of emotions. So when God made us in his image, he also made us with, um, with those emotions because of his relationship with, with, the, with the sun and, and the spirit. Uh, the second point that I'd like to bring about is that we see Christ being, uh, you know, a model of emotional functioning. So we know that Christ was holy God and he was holy man. And uh, we know that he's, he bears that perfect image of God. And it is in Christ that we see who, uh, who we are to be. And he is the model that we have. So we are designed uh, to be what, uh, what he, he had in, in, in himself. So as perfect man, Christ also experienced these uh, emotions. And we see that, uh, you know, the emotions of joy, compassion, anger, grief, um, uh, fear. Uh, so he expressed these emotions, um, you know, when, when, and, and it's written in, in scripture. So they, they were a part of the way he responded to the situation. So, um, so I, I would say that, uh, you know, this also, uh, it, it also helps us to see how do we respond to God given emotions that he's put in us so the emotions aren't bad in itself but the way that it is uh, laid out or the way that it is processed uh, or distorted becomes uh, sin yeah i just wanted to add that 
Thank you, Jane. Thank you for that. Uh, Christopher, uh, was that clear? Or do you have any follow-up question that you'd like to ask? Okay. Right. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Thank you, Jean, uh, for that question. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have a question from Divya, which is uh, uh, asked again at the bottom uh, from First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse seven to eleven. Her question is: Does this passage mean that each one is given only certain gifts according to the will of God? Okay. So the question again is: Does this passage mean that each one is given only certain gifts according to the will of God? Um, so, uh, Pastor Jekuma, would you like to take that question? Yeah, sure. So, so we um, so we read the. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, of course, I think uh, we are going to get into the class at 9. Uh, we're going to look at this chapter again, but anyway, very quickly. Uh, so this chapter, uh, you know, Paul doesn't want the Corinthian church to be ignorant, and he, you know, gives the list down the gifts and also the usage of the gifts and so on. So we see that, um, you know, uh, he goes on to say, he, he lists the gifts, and he talks about the gifts as the manifestation of the Spirit. And he go, uh, and he's, he's giving all this in the context of the local church, church gathering right so when we come together as a local church well the holy spirit he manifests he expresses himself in different um, you know in in these different ways and uh, uh, Verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he will. So we come together and there's the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, everything, and which um, the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, uh, expresses or manifests himself uh, in that in that local gathering. So when we gather together, one might come uh, with a word of knowledge. The Holy Spirit is expressing himself uh, with a word of knowledge. Another person, a word of wisdom. Another person, you know, uh, another uh, maybe tongues and interpretation of. So it's it's in the context of the uh, local church gathering, right? Um, the other thing that we need to understand is that uh, you know we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The gifts are an expression of the Holy Spirit and he's the one who indwells, right? So so all the nine gifts, um, you know, he is, uh, he wants to express through the believer for the edification of the body. That is what we see. So um, so that's, uh, uh, but it, it is he who distributes, right? Um, but on our part as a believers, we are to, expect we are to desire and that we see in the rest of the chapter like uh, uh, in uh, uh, verse same chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, we go to the end of chapter, verse 31. Um, he says, earnestly desire the best gifts, you know, yeah, plural, meaning more than one, uh, all, uh, earnestly desire the best gifts. Again, in chapter 14 and verse 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, right? So the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the objective of desiring is, of course, to receive and to, you know, uh, express, manifest the gifts um, so that uh, the church can be edified, so that it can be a blessing. So, um, so we see that it is the same spirit. And, uh, and as believers, we are to desire. And it's not just one, but many. So, um, uh, yeah. So, so I, I just uh, leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Pastor Jaykumar. I just had a follow-up. Is if it is time, I can ask in the class as well. Yeah, I think we are almost two minutes. <laughs> yeah, probably we can uh, have it in the class. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Jacob. Thank you, Divya. Uh, we quickly uh, just address uh, Shani's question. Shani, uh, you raised your hand. Yeah. Oh, yes. So um, my question is that um, I know that I learned in a faith class that when you're praying for somebody, you both have to have faith, or one person has to have faith in order for somebody to be healed. And I also know um, I've seen people lay hands on somebody and they get healed. And I know it says in the Bible that these signs will follow those who believe if you, you should lay hands on a sick, they should get well. And it says, Jesus said, things that I do, you could do greater things than these because I go to the Father. So I'm thinking about all this. So what I'm a believer. So when I have pain, I lay hands on myself. And I, and, and, you know, I speak to, you know, be healed in the name of Jesus. I also speak, you know, to my body. So why is it that if I'm a believer, why is it that I'm still having pain? I'm not healed instantly. Like I hear, like I see other people being healed instantly. All right. Thank you, Shani. Uh, Pastor Ashish, would you like to respond to that? 
Um, why don't we see you know personal healing uh, happen instantly? Instantly. Um, uh, yes, and I, 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 you know, let me say like this. I, I don't want to necessarily. I mean, we we cannot necessarily or clearly state this is the exact reason. But I would just you know generally what what we we know what we need to receive or minister healing, which is. God's word and faith, um, and the presence of God, and so on. So, uh, uh, my response would be: just continue to exercise your faith, uh, put the deposit of God's word into your heart, and uh, you know, uh, engage with God in His presence through worship. Um, there will be times, you, you know, we will see instant healing for ourselves and there maybe healing will happen progressively and it's okay as long as we get healed and are fine. Uh, but we continue to build our faith up. We continue to put the deposit of God's word in and uh, get into his presence. You know. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Thank you, Shani, for that question. Uh, okay, uh, Christopher, very quickly, Pastor Jakes has shared a link to one of the publications uh, that you can check it out. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, our today's mentoring hour. I uh, hope you had a blessed time. Uh, let's pray and bring the session to a close. Okay. Uh, John, can I request you to play, pray and bring the session to a close, please? Yep. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time of learning we had together. Lord, we pray that you would continue to lead us in the right direction and we would be able to walk with you. And even as we get into our daily classes, Lord, we pray that you would continue to speak to us, help us to grow more in your word. Thank you for all the faculty. Thank you for all the pastors. Thank you for all the students. We help us to love you more every day, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, John. Shani, very quickly, there is uh, another APC publication called Healing and Deliverance that you can download off for free from our website. So please feel free to do that. It's called Healing and Deliverance. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Uh, stay safe. God bless you all. Bye-bye.